All right, it sounds like people are busy enough, so what I'll do is just go over Chapter 7. This should take no more than an hour and probably less. All right, just so you know, we've gone through the first... This is not a big book. There's 13 chapters in the book. We've gone through the first six already, so it's your responsibility. If there's anything you didn't understand, to flip through the book, read the book, whatever, and come in and ask questions. All right, now we're going to go over Chapter 7. And then next Tuesday, we'll go over chapters 10 and 11. Then you'll get your next assignment. Your next assignment will be the other problems from the previous assignment. But what I'm asking you to do is to do some work with files. All right? And uh, so I've added a little bit of, you know, some caveats on there. We'll look at that in just a bit. So chapter 7 starts in your book. It's on page 100 and... 51, using arrays. You can see our objectives here. I'm not going to say stuff to you like what is an array, but that you are able to create arrays a little differently in this language. And I don't remember, because I think most of you had me for the 119 class. Did we talk about associative arrays in there? You know, you're used to an array. When you create it, you say something like this. So if you come in and you create an array, and you say, this is PHP now, so I can come in and say tests equal array, paren, paren. That's, that's how you can create an array. You don't have to give it a size or anything. And then I could just start adding stuff. So I can go tests bracket bracket equals 100. Tests bracket bracket equals 75. So that's going to take that array and so now tests sub zero is going to be equal to 100 and tests sub one, no shit brackets, is going to be equal to 75. Does that make sense to everybody? It's not that different from what we've done in other languages. All right, that stuff. But, but what you can also do is you can create associative arrays. Now here it wouldn't make much sense, but let's say that I create an array called states. So I'm going to say states equals array. And then I come in here and I say, in fact, we're going to call it MW for Midwestern states. MW states equals array. So then I'm going to come in here and say MW states bracket, bracket, equals, double quote, WI, double quote. In fact, we could use single quotes there and show it. We'll just put three in here. MW states, bracket, bracket, equals, let's say, Michigan. And MW states, bracket, bracket, equals, Illinois. Now, you all know this stuff already. So now it's going to be states zero equals Wisconsin. We could have done it that way also. We, so we could just have rewritten those like this. Uh, states one equals Michigan and states two equals Illinois. That's all fine. But if I'm working with states, I may not want to do this. I mean, using numbers for, for certain things doesn't make a lot of sense. So if I want to, as an example, just to show you another way I can do this, and instead of putting WI there, I'm going to put the whole name of the state, but I'm going to do it like this. So I'm going to come through there, and again, I'll create MW states equals array, just like we did before. But now I'm going to say this, MW states WI equal sign greater than sign Wisconsin. Michigan and Illinois. 
The last example that you see up here, this example here in the red, that's known as an associative array. So in other words, instead of using numbers for our subscript, we're using strings. If you do it that way, the syntax is you put the subscript in single quotes, then an equal sign followed by a greater than sign. There cannot be a space between the equal sign and the greater than sign. You can have a space here or here or both or neither, depending on how you want to set it up. But that's the difference. That's an associative array. So they're going to talk about that in the chapter also. So when we get there, so for people watching the tape, I'll just go over an example as one that's in the book. And actually, you can put a string variable in there too. You can put just you can you can put a string. You can put any kind of variable in. There. You can actually make it. What some people do, and I think this is dumb. All right, what they do, they don't want to use zero, so they have this one be a one, just the number one, and do it like that. I just say use put zero in there. Don't don't use it. You know, just put garbage in there, or just put the empty string in there. But I've seen people do that before. I'm not sure why. And of course, you know all this stuff because I've already broken how many rules here. So that would have to be a dollar sign in front of all these, and in front of all these, and in front of all these, and these, and these. I just have a really Christmas looking board up there right now. That's Are we able to put all them uh, on one single line inside, inside, inside of the brackets, like the W equal greater than Wisconsin, then separate it with a comma? And it all on one? Can you do it like that? Uh, I believe so. Yeah, I believe so. But normally you don't because when you do it that way, that's very close to the way you create a multi dimension array. Oh. All right. So you might not want to do it like that. All right. Now, the first thing they talk about in here are these super global arrays. We've talked about these before, but you can see that that's not a complete list up there. But that's, a, that's pretty many of them. Dollar sign underscore server, dollar sign underscore get, dollar sign underscore post, dollar sign underscore cookie, dollar sign underscore, underscore session, dollar sign underscore env. There's also dollar sign underscore request, and I think there's a few other ones. All right, if you really want to know them that badly, you can go into php.net and look up super globals. All right. We're going to hit with the uh, session especially. We're going to hit on that in a few weeks. All right. The rules for creating an array, basically your, your naming conventions, they're the same as any other variable. Start with a dollar sign, etc. First thing there must be a letter, and then any combination of letters, numbers, and underscores after that. Again, uh, Take case sensitive, just like uh, array, just like variable names, rather, just like a regular variable name. So notice, here's an example of creating this. I think that's kind of what you asked. So you could, you can do it that way. But, but there's, yeah, I guess you're right. There, there it is underneath there. So again, it's however you feel comfortable doing it. More often than not, instead of seeing it like this or like this, you'll see it more looking like that. You don't have to do that. All right, again. I, when I create code, especially if I know I'm creating code that somebody else is going to work on, I'll go out of my way to try to make it easy to read. All right, Because after I hand it off to them, I don't really want any more to do with it. I want to go on and be doing something else. All right? But everybody's different. Sometimes you go to a place and they have certain standards, etc. So this is an array here. All of them are. but um, And this is an array that's called dollar sign $list that's already initialized. Now, one thing about arrays in, in PHP, and it's like an array in, uh, in JavaScript, I can just go add other ones. So I showed you, I can keep doing this. Later on in my program, I can decide I want to add more Midwestern states. Maybe I want to add Ohio and Minnesota, et cetera. I just come in and add them later. That doesn't matter. The advantage of, of working like this in this example here, where I've got the name of the array bracket bracket, then the system puts it in the next available space. You don't have to worry about putting a number in there. If I do this, so if I create an array and that automatically becomes 0, 1, and 2, but if I accidentally put in here 16, I get the system does not complain. It just puts null in that in 0 and 1 are filled, but it puts null in 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way to 15. And it does that. It allows you to do that. In fact, if I put 16,000 in there, it would do the same thing. You say, well, why would you do that? I'm not saying you would do that. But if you fat finger or you do whatever, the, the system has no problem at all with you doing that. So again, that is a, a typical numerically indexed array right there. 
and that is what we call an associative array right here. So this is the subscript here, here, and here. The only thing I don't like about him showing that example right there, the one I put on the board is like that, but I use states. So here I use, for example, WI in single quotes, and then Wisconsin here in single quotes. And here I use like MI for Michigan in single quotes, and Michigan in single quotes. And here I used IL in single quotes and Illinois in single quotes. That's more often than not how it's used. All right. And there's absolutely nothing wrong ever, ever with numerically indexing an array. All right. Can, you know, I'm, I'm just asking this. Can anybody think of, of an advantage of doing it with an associative array? We haven't gotten there yet. You can't answer these. All right. Can anybody else think of when you might want to use that? How about if I made this the name of a database field and that was its value? Because that's what we're going to be doing. All right? And it's much easier, especially if you've got a database, you've got a table that somebody has, has created that they probably shouldn't have where they, where they just put too much information in it. You've got maybe 12 fields. Now, what, what was, geez, what was address? Was that six or was that seven? If you call it address, it makes it a heck of a lot easier. All right, there's a lot better correlation, and there's nothing that, that, that stops you from actually using the same exact names as the names that you use in the database itself. In fact, you most of the time you'll see that. You, you can abbreviate it if you want to, but a lot of times you'll see them the exact same name. All right, unless they are really long, then you might, yeah. I use a lot. Last time I remember using it was for state names to state abbreviations. Right, that's, that's, right, that's what we were getting into here. Yeah, that's... Yeah. And, and there are other things that make a lot of sense. I mean, this morning or, or earlier today, I guess it was in the ASP.NET class, we talked about text versus value. And for example, all right, this might be what you want to save in the database, but that might be what you want to show, that kind of thing. All right. Now, the example that they show through most of the chapter here is shown on the page here. I'm on page 155, and they're, they're working for like a mythical restaurant or something. And they have soup specials on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. All right? And again, since we're putting, since in an associative array, since we're putting it in these examples in single quotes, this could be more than one word. You could do that if you wanted to. Your code could get real messy real fast if you do that. That's another reason why when you're creating a database, in most databases, they don't allow you to have blank spaces in the names. All right, because they want you to run stuff together. So you don't have to worry about stuff like that. So again, rather than saying, let's, let's suppose, for just, just for lack of argument, that this restaurant's only open Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. All right, we're just gonna suppose that. So Monday, technically, we, we, if we left them off, if we just put in here, clam chowder in single quotes, comma, white chicken chili in single quotes, comma, and vegetarian, then instead of soups sub Monday, it would be soups sub zero which would be harder probably for most people to read and to understand. We had a gentleman here the other day, and most of you saw him when he was here, Mr. Contreras. And one of the things he kept saying was, when you guys get done with this project for me, I want you to make it as simple as possible so I'm able to change it afterward. Well, if I was doing something like that for somebody and they were going to be changing maybe the specials they had, I wouldn't want that well. When you work with arrays, they start with subscript zero. What? what? You know, to most people who don't walk the walk and talk the talk like you do, that wouldn't make a lot of sense. But if you say, well, this is what you're, what you're serving on Monday, they can look at it and pretty much understand. So sometimes there's a very natural type of key. All right, and this is also known in some languages as a key value type of setup. All right, where the subscript is the key and that's the value. The keys must be unique. You cannot, in this array, have another value in there that's called Monday. That would make no sense. That's like trying to put subscript three in there twice. The system has no way of understanding that. You'll get some kind of an error. If you say, well, what error is that? I don't know because I've never tried it. All right. Again already mentioned this, but I'm just saying it one more time. If you use the array function and you do that, that allows you to start indexing at 1 instead of 0. All 
right? There's absolutely nothing wrong with doing that. But if I wanted to do this and I just didn't like the fact, for example, here, I, you know, I didn't like the fact that Wisconsin was zero. I could have come up here and I could have put dollar sign Midwest states bracket bracket equals single quote, single quote, and just never used that one. All right, that would have been totally fine to do that. All right, and they mentioned that when you numerically index, they call it an indexed array, and when you otherwise it's called an associative array. For example, in, in uh, Perl, they refer to that as a hash. Some languages do. That can be confusing because hash can also mean other things. All right. All right, I already showed you this as far as how to add items to an array. I'm going to take a second and just show you this. So I'm going to go to php.net and I'm going to search and I'm going to say under the documentation, I want to do a search for array functions. All right, here's what you've got. Array function doesn't exist. Yeah, whatever. And I got to, maybe I should have checked in functions. All right, so array functions. You can see them, they start here. So you can see, I don't know how many that is, but my guess is just eyeballing it, maybe 30 of them. All right, maybe, you know, give or take. So they start to talk about some of the ones that you can use in here. So if I decide that I don't, you know, if I start to fill up an array, and that becomes pears is in list zero, um, tomatoes is in list one. If I don't put anything in list two, there's nothing there, but we've got pears in list three, and we've got tomatoes in list four. Notice here if we say this, if we say unset, that basically takes the value in there and it nulls it, it gets rid of it. The, the, the uh, location is still there, but there's nothing inside of it. Does that make sense? You can also go in there and say, for example, here, you could say list sub four equals single quote, single quote, or double quote, double quote, put the empty string in. There's a lot of ways that you can do it. All right. If you want to go and reset an entire array, if I go and do that now, so if I came down here and said dollar sign MW states equals array bracket, you know, paren paren, that just create the array is now has no size again and it's totally empty. That becomes important when we get to chapter nine in here and we talk about uh, about using sessions, all right? Because you want to make sure because all your session information, your name and all your good stuff that gets saved in a session variable. So you want to make sure that when that session's over, you destroy that that session array, and that's that's typically how you do it. You just say dollar sign session dollar sign underscore session equals array paren paren. Okay, so you'll see that again is what I'm telling you. Yeah, that's typically what with a session, it's going to be associated with a shopping cart. And you'll find that out because you're going to get to build one. All right. We'll, we'll start one, and then I'll have you work on it yourselves. So, all right. I already showed you how you can add elements to an array. Notice here, if you want to know how many elements are in an array, it's the count function, not length like we have in other languages. All right. And I've already shown you that page as far as uh, under php.net, just look through it if and when you get a chance and take a look at all the functions that are in there. Before you go and try to write something yourself, take a look at it and, and uh, see if something like that already exists. As it says here, that's one way you can add an element. That would either add an element or change whatever is at element one. You cannot do this. The system, that should make sense to you because that says you're trying to take add this and literally assign it to the array itself. That doesn't make sense. This, this, the system doesn't know what, what the heck you're trying to do. There's a couple functions that they mention here on page 160. Here's a merge function. All right. So if you wanted to take and create, so if you had that soups thing that we looked at before with Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and now we've got the soups, another soups in here with Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and we merged the two. All right, that's one way you can do it. And the author says it's even easier if you want. You can do this or you can do this. But with merge, all right, usually with merge, what you're doing is you're creating a brand new array. You don't have to, but normally when you merge, you're creating a new array so you can keep the old one.
But again, that, as always, that would be up to you and depending on what it is you wanted or were trying to do. All right. For each loop, we've looked at this in other languages. Again, as they mentioned right up above that, this is on page 161. Here the author says, the fastest and easiest way to access all of the values in an array is to use a for each loop. There's the syntax. And don't let it really throw you that much. All right. What this will do is this will allow you to access both the keys and the values. There's other ways that you can write it to access just the key or just the value if you want to do that. It's not as complex. So if I wanted just the key in here, I'd leave off this part. If I wanted just the value in there, I would leave off this part. That makes sense? All right. And you'll, you know, when they say this, if you haven't seen this yet in your work, you will. Errors like this, syntax, unexpected, T, underscore, and caps, uh, underscore, and underscore, white space. Most often that means that you have not uh, initialized a variable correctly. The system just doesn't know what it is you're trying to do. Printing the values, the same stuff we just talked about. Multi-dimensional arrays, which are next. This is what I was talking to you before about, Luke. So here's one array, all right, and there's another array. So we've got an array called fruits, an array called meats, but now we want to create an array called groceries, and it has in there both the fruits arrays and the meats array. So you can, you can create arrays of as many dimensions as you want to or need to do. Okay, That stuff is pretty much the same in every language. One nice thing that this language provides that most other languages do not provide in, in this much depth and breadth is if you turn to page 168 and you look on the page there, you can see the table on the screen. When you do a sort, it sorts in ascending order based on the values, not the keys, but the values. You can do an R sort, which does a reverse sort. You can do an A sort, all right, or an AR sort, but you can also sort on keys. Please take the time to read this section because they do a very nice job in here of explaining it, all right? Most of the time, you'll want to do a sort and you'll want to be sorting on the values. The keys probably aren't, aren't as important as the values that go with them. So as it says, you must keep in mind that an array consists of pairs of keys and values. If it's a non-associative array, then the key is a number, the subscript number, and the value is whatever goes with that particular subscript. So it says if you want to sort values and you don't care about the keys, you use sort. All right. In reverse, you do R sort. But it says to sort by keys while maintaining the relationship. So if you want to keep the relationship between the key and the value, almost always you do, then you use k-sort or k-r-sort. Finally, if you were working on a game, or what, what was that, that when iPods first came out, wasn't there a, not, there was, wasn't there an iPod shuffle? All right, that's, they just basically use a random number algorithm in here. So if, you, if you've got 15 numbers and you want them randomly each time, you can call shuffle, all right? And they give you some, some examples that are in here. So here's some grades. All right, as it says, the grades array consists of six student names along with their corresponding grades. Because the grades are numbers, they don't need to be quoted, yeah, when you assign them, all right? So then we come in on the next page. says we print them out in their original order and that's exactly what you think would happen all right then it says as the grades array will be printed three times captions are going to be used to show the state each time all right so it says sort the array in reverse order by value to determine who has the highest grade so we do a reverse sort as it says we need an AR for ascending or it's, it's sorry reverse sort as opposed to an a sort all right 
Notice, you must also use AR sort and not R sort if you want to maintain that. Because if we didn't, if we didn't, uh, if we used an R sort, for example, you'd still get the right answers, but now the names wouldn't be associated with those. All right? And that's almost always not going to be what you want. So again, there's uh, some really good examples in this section that goes over it in, in better than I just did. All right, a couple neat functions that, um, that this language has. They're called explode and implode, and they kind of do what you think they would do. Notice the first implode turns an array into a string. So in other words, if I've got an array with 15 grades in it, and I do an implode, it looks like one big string, that probably I put commas in between each one. But if I want to go the other way, if I've got a comma-separated list, and I want to convert it into an array, that's an explode. Understand the difference? Again, if you don't, just take a look on php.net. So why would you do this? Why would you care? Because PHP has got its own string functions. Some of them are duplicated for arrays and some are not. PHP has got its own array functions, some of which are duplicated in string functions and some are not. So if I had a, a string and it had, was maybe separated by blank spaces and I thought, wow, this would be really good for me to use this array function, I can use an explode and take that string and convert it into a character, or, you know, a string array, and then use the functions. And then if I want to, I can do an implode and bring it back together again. Can you do that with integers too? No, it's, it's just, I believe it's just set up to work with strings. But what you could do is you could, you, you could treat it as though, yes, you could, all right? The question was, could you do that with, with, uh, with integers? And yes, you could. But remember, when you start dinking around like that, the, it may lose its value, its arithmetic value. All right. But one of the nice things about PHP is it's, it's like JavaScript. It's so darn forgiving. All right. All right. So they give an example when they go back and forth between strings and arrays, arrays and strings. Okay. And I think it's just about the last thing that they discuss in here in this chapter is creating an array from a form. All right, it says, throughout this chapter, you've established arrays entirely from within a PHP page. However, you can send an array data from a PHP script. And here's an example when you might want to do that. If you were working for a pizza place, you might have, um, you might have an array of checkboxes, all right, that all have the same... Um, name but it had different values so maybe you, you maybe you offer 30 different types of toppings so you want to go through there to see which values have been ticked all right and that's what they're talking about on here all right we're going to get into this in more depth and breadth of coverage when we go over chapter the next chapter chapter eight we're not going to do that do these in order just so you know the next chapter that we're going to cover all right because that's basically it for this chapter but the next chapter that we're going to cover, in fact, there's only 328. If you don't mind, we can do one more right now because we'll still be done before 4. All right. So I'm going to jump then up to chapter 10, which is on creating functions. I'm not even going to stop the tape because it's, like I said, we haven't even gone a half an hour. So I'm just going to jump up to page 257. All right, creating functions. Guess what? You know, pretty much the same way that you've created functions in other languages. All right, there is a bunch of built-in functions, some of which you've used already, some of which we'll get to in later chapters, like set cookie. But I've already shown you the number format function when we wanted to format something to two decimal places. All right, if you want to create a, a new date object, you can use the date function. So there's a bunch of built-in functions, and in addition, in this chapter, they show you how to write your own functions to do different tasks. Now, if you notice some of the things that are in here, you can set default arguments in this language. You may or may not remember that, but when I showed you that future value, and I show, or when I showed you how to figure out the monthly payment, and I showed it to you in PHP, it's out there on one of those programs that I threw out there, we set up default arguments. Sometimes, again, 
if I'm writing uh, an application for Blackhawk, I'd probably default the state to WI or to Wisconsin, which just makes sense to do that. And then, you know, if we have some Illinois people or some other people, then you could go change it accordingly. So here's the syntax, the word function, followed by the name of the function, any parameters in parentheses, and then inside of curly braces, your statements. All right, I've, you've seen this before. Looks almost the same, almost the same as a, uh, as it's done in JavaScript. A couple years ago, I want to show you this, because a couple years ago I did this. I gave this to the students for an assignment. Okay, tell me if you think it's easy. So, this was a drop down, that was a drop down, and then this was a drop down. Okay, I had you use like 2010 through 2020, about 10 or 11 years, okay? January through November, 1 through 31. But, you had to have the right number of days in here, all right, for the month. And you had to account for leap years. I thought they were gonna kill me, because they worked on it you know, pretty hard, and a couple people actually got it to work. Most people are, were just were like they're beating their heads against the wall. You know, I can't even find anything like this on Stack Overflow. Yeah, yeah, then they're afraid to post something or whatever. It's a lot harder than you would think. All right, there's a lot of logic that's got to go into that. So no, that's not going to be one of your assignments. So. What's that? So can you use switch statements in this language? Can you, the question was, can you use switches? Sure. Yeah. All right. So they show you how they built it in here, but what they don't show you is every month looks like this. And to my knowledge, there is no February 31st. Okay. That's the easiest way to do that would involve some JavaScript. You, you know you actually can. I got it to work with just PHP. But it was a bear. But the easiest way to do it would be. It might be. Java. Yeah, it might be. And what was your question, Thwan? Oh, it does have 29, 29, 29. Yeah, but it also has, for so what it has is for every single day or every month it has 31 days. And that's not what we'd want. All right. Notice there's something called function exists. And you say, well, why would you ever use that? It's not, if you were working on a project with other people, you might say, I want to write this function and I know exactly what I want to call it. You might write some code first to see if somebody else has already written a function by that name, as an example. There might be other reasons that you'd want to do it too. <coughs> You've seen stuff like this before. Formal parameters and actual parameters. We had that, that discussion this morning in the C class. All right, so you've all seen this kind of stuff before. All right, now, this is gonna be the first time you've heard this term. This is all gonna change when we get to chapter eight. So if you would, I'm gonna give you a second. Take a look at that paragraph that I just put in blue. The idea is if you fill out a form, let's say that I've got a form with those magical 10 pieces of data in it, all right? And I f they're all required. And I, for some reason, I forget to fill out my zip code, let's just say, all right? If the form is sticky, it'll give me an error message, but one, it'll send me right back to the form and all those fields I filled in are still there. Does that make sense? That's a sticky form. You want to strive always to write sticky forms as a programmer. You want to make it as simple as possible. Because if it's too hard for somebody, they're just going to leave and go someplace else. All right? So you'll see how we do that. That's what a lot of Chapter 8 is about. Again, upon form submission, the previously entered values will be remembered. Okay? What ends up happening when you do this, 
this isn't a great example of it, but you're, you, you quite often are going to have just one file. All right, and everything will be in it. It'll be interspersed with both PHP and HTML. And you look at it and you go, well, geez, you know. If, as an example, let's suppose that every single, every program that you write has this in it. You with me? Every program that we write has this in it. Then what we're going to end up doing is we're going to copy that. I suppose it'll keep the line numbers, which I don't want. But So we'll have this. I'd pretty it up, but just so you get the idea. So then what we're going to do is we're going to end up saving this file, all right, and we're going to do a file, save as, and we'll do something like this just so you see it. I mean, I, I don't really care about the file or anything. But we're going to save it as something like header.inc.php. That's an include file, all right? Then when we write our actual code, instead of having this in there, we'll have one line of code. It'll say pound include, then inside of parentheses, header.php in single quotes. All right? And now if we put that on every page, we've got that on every page. If we have this on the bottom of every page, and normally there's going to be more stuff than that, you know, there'll be a disclaimer and the copyright and all, you know, maybe some information about the company, that's what we're going to end up doing using include files. All right? So we're going to get to that. Like I said, it'll be after the next assignment. The default thing I already mentioned to you, but I'm going to say it again right here. This is page 271. All right. And notice here, we've got function greeting. And then we've got who equals world. What that means is if, if you call greeting by itself, it's going to say hello world. If you call greeting with Zoe in it, it's going to say hello Zoe. Take a look at that, and if that doesn't make any sense, say something. You can have as many parameters, zero to all of them can be default, can be defaulted if you want. If you have default parameters and non-default parameters, the default parameters must be at the end in your parentheses up here. So if we had three parameters, this one and then another one called H1, dollar sign H1 and another one called dollar sign H2, if those were not going to have default values, they would have to come before this one. But again, why do you do this? If I was writing a tax program and I knew that, you know, I don't know if any of you watched the debate last night. All right, it was a really a captivating three hours as I turned back and forth between that and other things. But uh, there are a couple of the candidates. I think one of them is uh, Ben Carson. All right, you can have your own feelings about it, and that's fine. I could care less. You could probably care less about mine. But when I heard that guy saying that we should have a, a, net, uh, a tax rate based on natural tithing, I was scared. Some of the stuff that that guy, he seems like a really nice guy, and he, he's, he does, he's not at all a dum-dum. But when I heard some of his ideas, they just found him scary. And Rand Paul came in and said, I think there should be a national tax rate for everybody, and it should be 14%. That's what he said. The reason I'm telling you that is we could come in there and we could default our tax rate to 14%. Then if we had people that, for maybe, maybe we decide that anybody who makes under $10,000 a year, they don't get taxed at all. And anybody who makes more than $5 million a year, you get taxed at 25%. But for the, the rest of us that fall in between there, we could use that, and we'd have a lot less work to do. All right? And they show you exactly how this stuff would work. Again, you'll notice in this case, there's three parameters, and two of them have default values. So like I said, they must go on the end. In fact, I think if you try doing it the other way, you're going to end up getting uh, an error message anyway. Just like the other languages that we've worked with, PHP functions can return a value if you want them to. If they return a value, you typically want to put it someplace. So notice here, dollar full name equals Make full name, first name, and last name. So all we're doing is we're calling the function. We're passing this in. We're passing this in. We're combining them, and we're returning it. So that return dollar name will go into here. All right? And again, actual parameter name, actual parameter name, formal parameter name, formal parameter name.
In this case, they're not the same, which again, as we said, is totally fine. This is different, all right? So if you're the kind of person who at all marks up your book, you might want a dog ear or at least asterisk or do something because this is a different language. PHP allows you to return multiple values without having them go into an array without using pointers like we did this morning in C. All right? It says here's how you go about it. You do return an array, all right, but after you return the array, you call the list function, and it breaks the array up for you. So, you know, what you do is I could have, like, for example, I could have a function that would set a first name, middle, middle initial, last name, address, city, state, zip. And then I could basically say return that as an array, and as soon as you get back, run the list function on it and break it back into those seven individual variables again. It's kind of like the same thing as here we're almost doing an implode, and here we're almost doing an explode type of an idea. All right. See this line of code here? And look at the comment that's above it. This is page 277. All right, it says, if dollar sign underscore server, then in brackets, request method equal equal post, that's going to become very important because you're going to have some PHP near the top of your page that's going to check that. And that, what that's going to say is if you've beat, for lack of better words, if you've clicked the submit button, then you want to do a bunch of code. All right? But if you haven't clicked the submit button, you'll want to go down typically to the bottom of your form, and that's where you're going to show the form with nothing in it or whatever. So you're going to see this kind of code again and again for the rest of the semester. All right. When you work with scope in this language, variable scope, it's a little bit different. If I do this, it's easier to just show you it on the board. If I'm at the top of my program and I put in this, dollar sign age equals 21, all right? Now I've got a function in here. Function show age all right and I come in here and I say this I say print the age is dollar sign age anybody want to take a wild guess as to what that prints you would think it would print the age is 21 right it doesn't do that. And the reason it doesn't do that is it doesn't know because we haven't brought that, this down to let it know that that's a global variable. All right, so the way that you have to do that is you have to say dollar sign global, I'm sorry, not is it dollar sign, I think it's just global, global dollar sign H. Now I can come in here and say print the H is dot dollar sign age. Now it'll say the age is 21. All right? You've got to put that in there. And you need a, a global thing for every global variable you have. PHP will tell you you can say global dollar age, comma, dollar height, comma, dollar weight. I don't do that. Because I even though they say you can do it, I've done it already and had it not work. So if I want to make if I want to reference out here three different variables, age, height, and weight, I'll say global dollar age on one line global dollar height on the next line, global dollar weight on the next line. The order in which you'd put those wouldn't matter. We have to do that in every function we want to use it? Yes. Yeah. Because we going to say they're global outside the function and have them work inside the function? No. No. Global is no. Okay. And that's, there's, I, I understand the rationale behind it. It's because a lot of times with PHP, you're going to have, you're going to have files that are variables that are declared God knows where. And you might not even be able to find them. All right, so that to, to avoid any confusion and possibly creating another variable, all right, that's typically why they make you do it like that. I believe that's their rationale. So there it is. There's the global statement, okay? So if you're watching the tape and you go, well, geez, you didn't ex you put it on the board. Yeah, I put it on the board. All right. There's a good example of this, though, on page 282 in the book. 
So let's just very quickly, we're just about finished. So notice global tax because you define tax outside of it. If you define tax in another function, you pass it just like you would any other, you know, in, in any other language. But here we need to say global dollar tax. But it keeps the same value that you It know. keeps the same value. And if you change it now, that's the other benefit. Without any asterisks and ampersands, if I change it in here, so if I change it inside a function calculate total, it changes this one. All right. So it's kind of like pointers without the pointers. And I believe that's it. I think rather than going on and doing that last chapter, I don't know about you guys, but I'm enough spent enough that that's, that's enough for today. So what we'll do on Tuesday is we'll go over this. Now, before you leave, if you want to leave, that's okay. But before you do, I want to give you your next assignment. You can do some pretty crazy things with files. Yeah. Somebody that actually used the file in PHP to talk to the serial port to talk to an Arduino and made a web-based uh, robotic fish feeder. So you hit this web page, put in a password, and PHP with Intel's Arduino to scoop out a scoop of fish food and put it in the application. So the first one that you see up there on the screen is virtually the same as what we had before. Do the little guessing game type of thing. And uh, to be honest with you, too, there's, there's a method to my madness. One of the reasons I'm having you do this one, I want this to get back into your mind because this is when we get into Swift in five or six weeks, that's one of the first ones we're going to build as a Swift app, uh, you know, an iOS app, and we're going to build it as an Android app. It's one of the first ones that we're going to do. So uh, the logic will hopefully still be fresh in your mind. All right, I'm printing out copies for all of you right now. So that's the first one. Second one is, again, working with prime numbers, but also notice what I've added here. All right? When you're figuring all this stuff out, so you enter in a beginning number between 1 and 10,000 and an ending number that's got to be greater than the beginning and less than or equal to 10,000. So let's say I put in 1 and 100 as an example, okay? Then I want you to create one array that has just the primes. I want you to create another array that's got the non-primes. Then if you want, you can use merge or use whatever and combine those two together when you print all that stuff up. All right, so take a read on that when you get a chance. If it makes sense, all right, or if it doesn't make sense, then let me know. It's the same one that you were going to do before, but I just added that. And the last one, again, is the leap year, but the same kind of thing. The requirements are very similar. All right, create one array to hold all the years in the range which are leap years, another one in all the years which are not leap years, and print out on all screen. All right, print the third array to a file. So there's a little bit of work with files, and that's why I want to spend some time going over files with you on Tuesday. So we should be able to do that hopefully in about an hour or so on Tuesday. Then the rest of the period on Tuesday all next Thursday, and then the following Tuesday will be labs. Again, this should be, uh, what I'm handing out right now, this should be both on uh, Blackboard and out of the P drive, and also if you notice down towards the bottom left-hand corner on the page, it's due October 25th, so it's due more than a month from now. That said, as I've told you before, that doesn't mean that come the evening of October 24th, you say, I don't really ought to start working on this thing. I guess it's due tomorrow. No, you really should start on it before that. All right, unless there's any questions, that's all that I have. All of the uh, previous ones, so the C stuff is already out there. All those, those lectures, they're all out there already on YouTube and all the ones from this afternoon, the ASP ones, they're out there also. So I'm going to, I just did the one lecture here, so I'm gonna save that and that'll be out there before I leave today. That's it. If you find any errors on this when you read it, please let me know. I, didn't, I tried to, to reread it, but I didn't see anything.